This program was made with the support of the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland. Patrick Peterson of Ireland. Patrick was a Briton, and he came to Ireland. Patrick is the most famous Briton that went over to Ireland as a missionary. He saw Ireland as on the edge of the world. Saint Patrick. He came here to preach the gospel. He must have been way out on his own, and he must have been number one on the hit list to be taken out by those who were objecting to him. A man who is passionate and gives his life. He did face danger and he faced challenge. It was not easy for people like Patrick. And this man to stand up against these people with his small church almost. He must have been a charismatic person, and he must have been able to talk to people in their own language because you can't make any headway with people, and you can't move them away from one philosophy to another without being able to do that. What he did was incredible. He managed to really get a foothold for Christianity in Ireland, as nobody else has succeeded in doing. Patrick's mission has to be described as being successful. I'm Paul Wright and welcome to the first programme of Back from the Brink, the series which investigates the role of the early medieval Irish in helping to save Western civilization. Now mention civilization to most people and most often images of the Fertile Crescent or pyramids along the Nile come to mind. However, you'd be hard pressed to find many people who'd think of Irish civilization. Yet, believe it or not, for one glorious period in history, as the 5th century Roman Empire disintegrated into ruin, the newly Christianised and newly literate Irish people helped to resurrect Western Europe from the so-called Dark Ages. Our story begins, however, not in Ireland, but on the western shores of Britain, where in the year 385 AD, a man called Patricius, better known to our modern world as St. Patrick, was born. Here's Tim Campbell, director of the St. Patrick Centre in Downpatrick, County Down, to explain Patrick's roots. Well, Patrick was born into the Roman world, possibly in the southern part of Wales, the southwestern part of Britain. He lived in a place called Banna Taberniae, and we don't know where that is really, but we think that it is in that part of Britain. He would have been a a young, well-off Roman. His father was a cleric, a man called uh, Calpurnius. His grandfather was a, a cleric as well, a guy called Petitus. And he would have lived in a Roman villa, but at a strange time for the Roman Empire, the Romans had been in Britain for hundreds of years, but from 410 AD, the Romans were starting to go back to Rome. The legions had been called home because they were being threatened by the barbarians. When the Roman Empire began to crumble... The Romans withdrew their legions from the fringe countries of the Empire first. Early medieval historian Kate Tristram of Holy Island, Lindisfarne. And of course Britain was absolutely on the fringe uh, because they never conquered Ireland. This was the edge of the Empire. And so they took the legions away from Britain in the early 400s. The Britons were very distressed and actually (laughs) got in touch with Rome and asked to have the legions back and they were told to see to their own defences. And then, with the legions gone, Britain was actually um, uh, attacked. Well, if you can imagine for 400 years, you have been living in peace and prosperity, you've done very well, you're living in a big fancy house, Um, you've got your own slaves, you're part of a really big empire, Uh, The next thing is, it starts to dwindle, all the support starts to go away, the trade starts to go away, and you start to become threatened by people who had previously been trading with you. So the the people who lived in Ireland in those days was called Hibernia. Uh, The Scotti were the people who lived in Hibernia. Now, we call Scotland, modern-day Scotland, Scotland because the Irish invaded Scotland, and that's why we call it that. But So the Irish were coming over, previously had um, helped in terms of, they, they had helped with trade, but now they were coming over in raiding parties and they were taking people like Patrick away. 
born in Rome and Britain, kind Patrick was his name. As Caesar's empire fell apart, the Irish pirates came. To take the lad in 401, to county down a slave. A shepherd in the Slimish hills, a holy road to pay. And he must have returned, he was 16 years of age. He came from a stable, loving home, we're told that, in his own writings. County Down local historian and patrician scholar Albert Colmar. There was a stable society all around him. Uh, he didn't much enjoy education. That comes through in his life story. He's just a normal lad at 16 years of age and suddenly screaming, yelling, shouting, mayhem, women being raped, people being killed and he was captured and brought back to Ireland to be sold as a slave. He must have been out of his mind. First of all, being a Roman Briton, he probably would have spoken the language of that time. He, uh, the language of the church was Latin. But coming into him, a foreign land, among strangers, who was speaking of the Gael, he wouldn't have understood what was happening. He was utterly terrified. But if you can imagine Patrick as a young teenager, if he'd had an iPod, he'd have had those things whacked into his ears. 16-year-old, not interested in religion. His father's a, a cleric. He doesn't really care about that. He's interested in having fun. He's got slaves. He's living in a big house. Life is good. Suddenly he's transported from that world into a, a very different world. He becomes the slave himself. Historian Tim Campbell. So just how hellish would Patrick's new slave world have been? Down Patrick based historian Sean Grogan. There was a, a great po- programme on television some years ago called Roots, and it showed the slaves who were brought in the most atrocious, inhumane conditions on the slave ships uh, from West Africa over to uh, America. And I remember well one of the scenes with a guy called Kunta Kinte. And there he was standing with other slaves in the market square with these manacles on him. And then this particular moment when he was sold as a slave to this particular man, just like a piece of property. And then this man put a brand iron into the fire and branded him. This is my property, just like you do with a cow or a sheep. He was an animal. He had no rights. He could be used and abused according as the owner wished. Now, if that was the case in the 19th century and 18th century, uh, what must it have been uh, in the 5th century? And I feel that, uh, you know, certainly they would have had, he would not have been able to appeal to any tribunal, uh, human rights organisations or anything else. He was a a chattel in the hands of uh, his owner. And you could imagine perhaps they would feed him in order, but why would they feed him? So that he would be a useful animal, uh, to look after the animals, so to speak. If you can imagine yourself out on the side of a mountain with no shelter at all, looking after animals, and presumably there was some kind of of a very basic, uh, you know, covering for himself at night time to lie down, otherwise he would have perished. I mean, it's just a question of how much... a young person can take without, uh, you know, suffering from hypothermia and so on in, in the winter time. Joseph Duffy, historian and also author of the best-selling book on Saint Patrick, called Patrick in his own words. Again, the extreme kind of uh, what what do you call it? Changeability of the Irish climate. You know where you can have you can have warm, moist weather uh, one day, even in the middle of winter, and then it can be freezing. It can be ten degrees under or under the next. I mean, to survive in that kind of climate uh, is is in itself an enormous feat. Then there are there are the other attendant problems of language difficulties. 
a slave master relationship you know which would again would have been very very harsh we don't know enough of course about that we don't know how he was actually treated whether he whether he was very cruelly treated or whether he was treated with 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 some kind of a modicum of kindness but however he was treated the relationship was very definite it was a master slave relationship so you have the you have the climate uh, and and the very very harsh conditions uh, you have the, the the relationships problem with 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 his with his masters and so on uh, and then of course you have the 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 isolation uh, if you could imagine yourself being being locked up in prison or even in an open prison where you know nobody and where people are are afraid of each other and and suspicious of each other well then you get begin to get some idea of just just the trauma that this thing was Life must have been hell on earth. It was horrendous for him. And that was the saving grace was he remembered the stories his mother told him about God loving him. And he said that what kept him alive was remembering these stories and himself having developed a personal faith in God. And he prayed to him hundreds of prayers, both day and night. So Patrick obviously turned to the only person he believed, and that developed that developed into a personal relationship, and that what probably kept him sane, if nothing else. Historian Albert Colmar. Here's Joseph Duffy once again. He never lost this Christian faith that he got as a child, even though he says that uh, as, a, as a young fellow he was careless about it. But uh, I suppose on the side of the mountain he, he, he got a renewed sense of his need for God and the mystery of of, of, of God in his life, and, and he cultivated that intensely. And that stood him in good stead. It gave him the kind of strength that he needed, you know, to, uh, I suppose, to really endure, and, and not only that, but to fulfill himself as a person. He said himself that, that he really found God again. Uh, when in the loneliness and the depression and so on, he turned to God and he, then he began to say, he said he prayed many, many times during the night and so on. So he got his faith back again. Down Patrick historian Sean Grogan. I suppose like many young people, myself included, I suppose, uh, the late teenage years, a bit rebellious and, well, religion doesn't matter much. But then he got it back again in that loneliness uh, the distractions were all gone he was on his own and now he, he said where am I what does life mean and began to pray to God his prayer life when we say talk about him praying 100 times on the mountains he talks about that himself I, I think that you know you could get a negative view uh, that would say, well, oh, I wouldn't like that because that sounds like a, a, a very monotonous business of having to say a hundred prayers. It's not like that. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a sense, really, of moments of concentration, moments of kind of where he's aware, moments of awareness, moments of, of admiration, moments of thanksgiving, moments of praise. Even even the, the passing things like uh, you know the, the the mystery of a dawn there the mystery of the sun going down the the skyline and the, and the, the color of the clouds and so on the, the miracle of, of 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 spring every year and the summertime and and the seasons. So over the first few years of his slavery, Patrick made his peace with the world. Day by day he prayed and grew spiritually stronger until he became a holy man. So what kind of prayers did Patrick the shepherd slave pray on the slopes of Slemish Mountain in County Antrim? The most famous prayer traditionally associated with him is called Patrick's Breastplate. And although nobody can be absolutely sure that he wrote it, nevertheless it exudes his spirit outright. The spirit of a man who, although a slave physically and legally, is spiritually free and able to sing the world's glories. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. 
I arise today to the strength of heaven, light of sun, radiance of moon, splendor of fire, speed of lightning, swiftness of wind, depth of sea, stability of earth, firmness of rock, God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me. Yes, Christ with me, before me, behind me, Christ in me, beneath me, above me, Christ on my right, on my left when I lie down, when I sit down, Christ when I arise. I arise today with the Trinity around me. I arise today with the Lord to be my guide. Creator of creation, He will be my flame. I arise today and worship in His name. I arise today with the love of all the angels. I arise today with the prayers of righteous men. The strength of heaven shines in the radiance of the sun. The whiteness of the moon or the new day just begun. With the splendor of the fire, the deepness of the sea, I arise today to be upheld by Thee. It's such a powerful hymn that he didn't just sit down on a sunny afternoon and think that would be a nice thing to do. I think it came right from the heart out of great stress. St. Patrick enthusiast Joyce Watson it sounds to me that it was born out of um, real hardship and maybe having his back against the wall and knowing how desperately he needed to depend on God, um, seeing the strength in the power of the sea and the, the lightning and the moon, um, knowing that there was a power greater than himself out there that um, was on his side. Patrick's breastplate. I think it expresses the uh, the confidence felt by a man who ha was beleaguered, you know, who was surrounded by by enemies, by people who did not agree with or understand him. Celtic church historian and renowned Scottish poet Jan Such Picard. And here he's expressing the the conviction of God's support uh, not that god's taking sides but god is just deeply within his life um, and this is what's going to give him the energy to go on with what he feels god's calling him to do and i think it's that it's that individual sureness of a relationship that grows over a period of time until it's something that no matter what somebody else says you know that you know that you know the person that you know and who knows you through and through. Celtic church historian Andy Rain of Holy Island, Linda's Farm. Here's Albert Colmer and Joseph Duffy to once again share their views. He was free from any potential harm in earthly form. And if we read his words, there's many variations on, on the breastplate. And he talks about, I raised today through a mighty strength through confession of the oneness of the Creator. He was free. He was free, spiritually free, to do. He believed God would protect him as long as he was doing God's will. And in that strength, he was fearless. And that was his strength. It's the kind of self-confidence that we associate with people, you know, who can survive concentration camps and, you know, indefinite spells in, in, in prison and so on, in solitary confinement and so on. There are people, even, even in today's world, in, in, who, who have had this experience and they're extraordinary people, of course. Patrick's breast space is a little bit, little bit like hearing the throbbing of the engine that's going to drive uh, not just ma this man's life, but a whole mission. God's strength be my guide, God's love be my aim, God's shield be my refuge, 
keep me from all pain oh keep me from all pain Christ be on my right hand Christ be on my left Christ be in my thinking and ever in my breast Christ be in my thinking and ever in my breast Christ be on my right hand Christ be on my left Christ be in my thinking and ever in my breast Well, there's a guy who keeps showing up in Patrick's life uh, called Victoricus, the angelic messenger. If you ever go to Flemish, there actually there's a little mountain beside Flemish where his foot is supposed to have been uh, ingrained on that particular mountain when he came to see Patrick. I call him Victor the Postman. Whenever Patrick was on Flemish Mountain, Victoricus, the angelic messenger, comes in and he says that Patrick should run away, that his ship is ready. So he runs to southwestern part of Ireland probably he runs 200 Roman miles so that would take you sort of Waterford Wexford sort of direction and it was there that he decides that he he should try and get onto a ship and get out of the island of Ireland the thing is as an escaped slave very very difficult for someone to go across Ireland because it was a patchwork quilt of petty kingdoms and in any one of those little kingdoms you could have been abducted, you could have been brought back into slavery. Often escaped slaves were, were killed or murdered. Historian Tim Campbell of the Patrick Centre in Downpatrick. Here's Albert Colmer to continue the story. How he escaped, to use a modern term, he knew safe houses. Houses that uh, contained believers, he knew the language, he had a safe route because in a strange country without modern day road maps, how could he have found his way anywhere from the northern part of this island way down to the south east? And I should in fact he did escape. So when Patrick comes to um, probably the southwestern part of Ireland, he meets some sailors and he thinks, well, uh, angelic messenger has told him that, that these are the guys who are going to get him off the island of Ireland. So he does, he goes over to them and he says, look, I want to I want to come with you. Now the sailors may have been traders, they may have been pirates, we just don't know. But he eventually is refused access. You see, sailors are very superstitious people. And they didn't like people to come on, they didn't like women on board, they didn't like people with red hair on board. They actually thought it was uh, unlucky to be able to swim and we've all sorts of accounts, even up to the 18th and 19th century, of sailors who drown within sight of the quay a few hundred yards out because they thought it was unlucky to swim. So they refuse Patrick entrance onto the boat, and uh, as he's walking down the beach away from them, he starts to pray, and they change their mind, and they shout at him, and they say, well, look, come on back, we may need an extra person. And the reason that they didn't initially, one of the reasons they didn't initially take him on board was that he refused to partake in a pagan custom of friendship. Um, and that is, that's why they didn't initially. And they must have been shorthanded enough to say, well, not to worry, even if you are sort of a strange Christian person, rather than believing in our pagan gods, you can come on anyway. We must, we must have needed an extra hand. He boarded a ship with a pagan crew which also then travelled a long, a long way uh, by sea, possibly to Brittany. Michael King, historian and also curator of the Down County Museum. Uh, but it was a deserted place and uh, there was no food or anything for them for a long time until they came across a herd of pigs and managed to feed themselves. He, I think he saw this as a miracle and managed to feed the crew with, with these pigs. And they were taken uh, prisoner and enslaved a second time and not, not many people realise this, that they were captured a second time, I think, and then he escaped again and managed to get back to his family. He managed to get back to his own people and I always would have the height of admiration for uh, not just his resourcefulness but he was obviously a very, very intelligent young man uh, who had his wits about him and who was able to, who, who read people very, very well and was able to, uh, you know, just where his own interests lay. 
historian Joseph Duffy. As he discovered when he went back to among his own people, he had this. Uh, he describes this vision at night that he had a sort of a dream where he, he found the people that he had left behind in Ireland that they were calling him to go back there and to preach the gospel. Now he had a very obviously had hadn't hadn't a very nice time in Ireland, and it wasn't from a human point of view, it wasn't the most pleasant of of, of prospects to have to go back there, but. The call seemed to be very strong and he found that he couldn't go against it. But then the visions didn't stop They bid him to return To speak the word of God's sweet love And the lessons to be learned Awake the hearts of every man with gospels to embrace and ban the sin of slavery within the Irish race. They thought he was mad when he told them he was going to go back as a missioner to this island that had captured him. They thought he had spaced out. And uh, anyway, we, we do know he eventually uh, was commissioned by the laying on of three brother bishops' hands in Oxford. He then came back. Many people objected to him coming. He was unlearned. He was unskilled in the language. But he had this driving faith referred to in the breastplate prayer, prayer. He came back. Historian Albert Colmer. Here's historian Michael King once again. Not long afterwards, you know, he had the angel come back to him to really appeal for him to go back to to convert the Irish, to save the Irish. But part of his motivation might have been that he had friends or relations. Much a later life says that he was kidnapped with two sisters, although that's that's the, the tripartite life, which is much later. So it's possible that he did have family who were also enslaved back in, in Ireland. And, but he wanted to go, and he had the advantage that he could speak Irish by this time. And not many missionaries would have had that at that time. Obviously he spoke Latin, and he would have known a Celtic tongue that was used in Britain at that time, which was slightly different to Irish. But he did know Irish, and this would have been a great advantage. And to find out how Patrick fared in his mission to the pagan Irish and how he miraculously managed to stay alive, then make sure to catch our next number two programme in this Back from the Brink series. This programme was made with the support of the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland, songs by Cliff Wedgbury. Until our next programme, from myself, Paul Wright, bye for now. <laughs>